Over seven million different animals inhabit our planet. Yeah, I don't think you can outswim them. They're great. <laughs> They're great swimmers, and and even if you wanted to, you definitely cannot outclimb a black bear. You can't outclimb a grizzly. Let, let me tell you the story, okay? What can they teach us? So, how common is this, Angie? What do you think? I mean, it's per year. How many? human bear conflicts would you expect in the United States? Several hundred? Whew, you're way under. Oh, way oh, under. Oh, Many species are in crisis and need your help. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com If I hear that in the woods, I am running crazy in some direction, even though that's not really what you're supposed to do with bears. But that noise, since I was a kid, is something I was always frightened to hear. Oh, good, Chris. I'm so glad that vocalization came through. I actually have my cat, Bear Bear, (laughs) which is her name. Bear Bear, yes. On my lap, and she's purring really loudly, so I don't know. (laughs) It's not it. Yeah. Anyways, she's very, Bear Bear, my kitty cat, (laughs) is very excited that we're covering the American black bear today. Yes, yes, yes. We're back to the bears, and this one, again, different from other bears. I mean, every bear species we cover has a lot of unique qualities, and this one, you're going to learn a lot today about black bears. Oh, yes. Besides, obviously, the vocalizations and yeah. just really cool behavior and physiological adaptations. And hopefully, Chris and I will be busting some myths today, too, that people may have about bears, uh, especially black bears in general. Because although they can make those loud roars, they actually make wonderful coos and grunts and moans mm-hmm. and lots of affectionate signs. And yes, it's just going to be a lot of fun today talking bears. It is, it is, and you know, looking at black bears, they, 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 it's like a lot of these late species, latest species we've been covering from North America, almost hunted to extinction, or at least in some areas of the United States in the 1800s, as as the Europeans moved west, you know, they they were hunting a lot of species: bison, turkey, now black bears. So you know, they they were persecuted, but they they have made a comeback. They're doing relatively well. But as you're going to find out, there is a lot of human bear conflict, which I'm going to cover. Also, we have an amazing interview we're releasing on Thursday with the Sierra Club. And it was focusing on gray wolves, but it really gravitated more to indigenous people and indigenous rights. It's a really unique take on conservation because we brought in, I had Bonnie Rice from the Sierra Club. Sierra Club is an amazing organization, and we'll talk about them at the end of the podcast. But then we had Rain Bear Stands Last, who is the executive director of the Global Indigenous Council. And he really talked a lot about the politics of conservation and effects on indigenous people. So, yeah, it's political, and he gives his political opinion. It, it's he, he holds nothing back. But it's just a, it was a fascinating interview listening to him talk, Bonnie, you know, joining in, talking about how wolves, you know, and 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 how we we really, Angie, we really talked a lot about how like wolves and bears are so important symbolically to indigenous people in the Americas. So it's an amazing interview. Look for that this Thursday. Awesome, Chris. I can't wait for it to come out. I remember talking to you right after the interview, you messaged me and you were glowing and you're like, this is one of the best interviews I've had. I've learned so much. And that's what we we love about this podcast is getting to hear different views and opinions from from a variety of backgrounds. And the black bear is just one of the most familiar bears found in North America. Mm -hmm. So I, I hope we can pay tribute today not only to the black bear, but to the Sierra club. Mm -hmm. 
and to Rain Bear Stands Last. So uh, thank you for joining us. And to all of our listeners out there, check out that interview later this week. Yeah, he just had me call him Bear during the whole interview. So this is very uh, poignant that we're doing the uh, the American Black Bear for him. And then quickly before we get started, just a thank you to Amberly, Suzanne, Chris, and Patricia. So all joined us on Patreon this week. I so appreciate it. Check out, you know, for all of our listeners, go check out our new episode pages. So Dan, our, our website designer, is doing an amazing job with that. We're still working. We're going to update the homepage soon. And it's just, we're going to put in some other options so it makes it easier to navigate, find our episodes, but at least the new episode pages look sharp and, you know, makes it easier for you to listen, subscribe uh, for us. And then again, we give back to organizations each month and with Angie's pregnancy, we're going to try to get some more content on Patreon here very soon. So thank you so much for supporting us. Yes. Thank you, everyone. I know I get to talk about mama bears today, which is Mm -hmm. pretty apropos for my current physiological situation. I was teaching an anatomy and physiology class uh, last week, and it was nice. We got to do an in-person lab, outdoors, socially distanced. But I was joking a lot about my very obvious, I'm heavily pregnant, Mm -hmm. (laughs) big old baby belly, uh, about my uh, my own physiological situation that's that's, uh, happening in my body and how it's... uh, very interesting. And <laughs> I'm, I'm lucky, though. I'm a pretty easy pregnant lady, so no complaints. Mm-hmm. I would like to give a huge shout out to Gabe M.W., who gave us a wonderful review on iTunes, said our podcast was fun and educational, which it doesn't get much better than that because yep, yep. if you don't have a little fun with education, then you don't want to keep learning. So we really appreciate the five stars and your kind words and and anyone out there that has a few minutes, please drop us five stars on iTunes podcast uh, and a couple kind words would be great. It helps get our podcast into circulation for other people out there that are unfamiliar with us. So please keep up the kind words. So getting back to the black bear, pretty easy to describe. It's a bear that is normally dark brown, maybe blackish for normally quote unquote, right? I mean, what are some other unique features of it? Well, yes, Chris, its name suggests black bear, right? We're used to the grizzly or the brown bear or the polar bear, which is, of course, white. Uh, But depending on the subspecies and the range, black bears can come in brownish colors or even cinnamon. On rare occasions, they're actually off-white, if you will, uh, mm-hmm. about 10% of the population of the Kermode subspecies found in British Columbia carries this gene. That is so, the... Spirit bear. Yeah. Yeah. The spirit bear. Yep. Yeah. So amazing. Yeah. That's yeah, a real so thing. Amazing. So yeah. we'll put some of that on our show notes and Chris uh-huh. will go through all the subspecies because I was... Because Chris, I was really surprised about how many subspecies of black bear there are yeah. in North America. And I'm lucky enough to live in Florida where we have our own subspecies here, the Florida Mm -hmm. black bear. And I'll talk a little bit about that when we get into conversation because their numbers have been growing over the past 20 years. However, they are still pretty low uh, Mm -hmm. here in the state of Florida. And I mean, I've obviously never seen one, uh, even though they're allegedly somewhat in my area. Yeah. So they're definitely not out of the woods yet. And we need to make sure we're keeping an eye on that subspecies and that population. I'm going to get to it, Angie, and then talk about it. There's 16 subspecies. So you're right. Florida is one of them. And then before we jump to range real quick, so that just the size of a black bear, because people have images of either they're either huge or small, mm-hmm. and, and they can range from five to six feet in, in height or length. You know, if they stand up, they'll be that tall. They can weigh up to 600 pounds. So large males probably get in that range, but they can weigh as less as 200 pounds. So, you know, black bears aren't massive like grizzly bears or brown bears or polar bears. Right. And across the board, they are the smallest type of bear that we, in general, and type of bear that we have here in North America. Right. Right, right. I mean, the but the sun bear is the smallest, but the American black bear is probably in between that and mm-hmm. a grizzly. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, fascinating species, though, still, like how, how they've survived. Because when you talk about their range and thinking about these guys, they range from Alaska 
all the way through Canada. So they're just not polar, like polar bears, even though there's probably a little overlap in there, maybe just a tiny bit. And I have not come across any cross breeding with polar bears and black bears. I know we covered it in grizzlies that, that they have found hybrids of grizzlies and polar bears, but there's probably a little bit of overlap between polar bears and black bears. So that's how far their range is north. Then you come down into the lower 48 of the United States and their, their, their historical range was most of America minus the deserts. Today, very fragmented some areas in the national forests down the West coast into California. So when I was living the mountains where I would see in the distance, there was black bears there. Then you have the East coast going down, but again, broken up because of, of humans, but down into Florida, they go as far South as North Mexico. So even in the mountain ranges, the Sonora mountain ranges. I was surprised by that. I, I was not aware. Yeah. Yeah. So, so huge range, huge range of this, of this bear. But again, historical range, I, I, most in the lower 48s, yeah, I'd say two thirds, three quarters of it's gone, just gone, you know, Kansas and Oklahoma. I mean, there's some parts of Oklahoma, they're still there, but like Nebraska, the Dakotas, there's no black bears there anymore where they used to range before humans went through. So anyways, amazing species because they play a, a, another key role, right? As a as an apex predator, I mean, not quite at the top, but they're up there. Well, yes. I mean, they're definitely up there as far as size and the amount of food they consume. And we'll talk a lot in nutrition about their diet. They're omnivores, but primarily herbivores right. uh, in general, depending on the season and where they live and how desperate they are for food. And <laughs> most of their omnivore habits come from human conflict of digging mm-hmm. in our trash. Right. So right. so the big impact that black bears are going to have on the ecosystem is going to be how they influence insect and fruit populations. Mm-hmm. And because they do consume a lot of fruit, they're known for their seed dispersing mm-hmm. habits, which Chris and I have talked a lot about the importance of that keeping the cycle going Mm -hmm. of eating the fruit and then planting it in a different location in your feces. So black bears can definitely help keep certain insect populations under control. But in the same instance, I think the seed dispersal of the different fruits and plants that they eat is really key. Yeah. Yeah. As a bear is an apex predator. You're right. Like it, 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 you don't see black bears as, as hunting, even though they do and they can as like say a wolf. You know, a mm-hmm. wolf's not going to be eating the amount of vegetation that a bear does. Absolutely. I mean, if any at all, you know, they right. might a little and bit. Then I, right. And then and as far as food web goes, on the flip side of it, a black bear can be a predator to smaller play, prey such as rabbits or deers, mm-hmm. things like that. So yeah. they help keep those populations in check as well. Yeah, they're kind of all-purpose, multi-purpose. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Swiss Army knives of bears, you know. Yeah. The, the black bears. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and so we've alluded to it. So, so I, I hit this head on, and that is human wildlife conflict, or specifically black bear and human conflict. It is a major issue in Canada and the United States, major issue. And so I went digging a little bit, and as Angie said, the 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 big thing is is digging in our trash, right? So I'm going to talk about how this all gets started with bears. And the problem specifically with black bears. And I'll say black bears are brilliant. Like in in Yosemite, I've seen videos of black bears opening car doors, getting in, you know, rummaging through cars to get to food. Like they are very intelligent. Oh, yes, Chris. They can open the bear proof containers. Like put your food in here because bears can't open it. Psych. Black bears can. Yeah, they're so, brilliant. And they're, I'll, they're, I, yeah, I'll talk about some studies later on when we get to intelligence, but they're they're very, very intelligent. Yes. Yeah, they're brilliant. They're brilliant. And so you, you think about urbanization through the United States, through Canada. So you're starting to see a lot of this conflict. Now, I'm going to put this statistic out there. Black bear attacks on people are ultra rare. Roughly, 
one person per year is killed in North America by a black bear. And that's not every year, but statistically speaking, it's like 0.8 or 0.9. So they say about one in a million black bears will have predatory behavior on people. It's just not in their DNA where grizzlies, you know, they take out a few more people per year. But again, I think that was five or six. It was still very low people that died per year to, to bears. So black bears are even less when you look, especially when you look at it from the view of how much conflict there is and and the statistics are going to surprise you. So the, the most common problem in all of this, in this study that I looked at the U S fish and wildlife and a few other agencies uh, chimed in on it is basically human food. That is the primary driver of why black bears are having conflicts with people. Garbage is number one, but then things like bird feeders, people leaving pet food outside, fruit trees, all bring bears in. And that starts the whole cycle of them habituating people with food. I'll tell you what, I remember, I think I I said this story in raccoons. I remember in San Francisco, I left dog food. I'm living in the city. In the big city, I left some dog food out, and the next thing I know, I heard some rustling, so I went downstairs, and there was a family of raccoons eating all the dog food. It's so cute, because I love raccoons so much, but I was blown away. So there was a you know a city-dwelling raccoon that knew humans provided food. Very similar for black bears. They learn to habituate this. So what human food does is bears change their behavior. And they start taking advantage of human food or they'll destroy, like I told Angie, getting in the car, like they can destroy cars to get to food. They're that, you know, that determined. And so that has led to a lot of nuisance bears. Mm -hmm. And when you get a nuisance bear, you can either do non-lethal relocation or you can just go out and shoot and kill them or lethal, you know, use lethal means to kill them. And they do. So it's really humans are the problem (laughs) causing this conflict. Yes, absolutely. And well, and I think also it's important to touch on too, is sometimes black bears become nuisance bears because they're fed by people either when they're younger or they just, they are a shy, timid like bear. So people maybe don't feel as threatened by them if they're a little bit smaller in size and you feed them once it's like game over for them. You are not helping them out or even leaving food out for them. You're not helping them out at all because they're going to learn that behavior and it's just going to accelerate. And it doesn't usually end very well for the black bear, as you mentioned. No, yeah, I got the statistics on it. So, so living with bears.com put out this, bear behavioral ladder progression. And and I'm going to sum this up because it it really shows you the problem. So you have a black bear out there and they smell something. Again, bears have greater sense than dogs, right? I I think I remember that from, from grizzly bears. So they follow their nose to a place where there's food, but they see people. So they're, they're timid. They wait till the people leave or dark, and then they'll go in and look for that food. So let's say it's like bird seed from a bird feeder. They will go and eat the bird seed and get into the bird feeder and eat it all and then run away. You know, then they come back a few days later, the bird feeder's full again. So they'll go back, eat some more bird feed and and get out. And then while they're doing that, they may smell some garbage. Ooh, this smells interesting. So they'll go over, knock over a trash can, start eating you know, our leftover food and stuff. So these food rewards are positive reinforcement with no negative consequences. So they're starting to go, oh, this is an easy source of food. It's yummy. So I'll keep coming back and back and back. It reminds me of the movie Over the Hedge, you know, like the bears and the, all the animals like sure. yeah. getting to the neighborhood. Right. So then they, they come in, they start exploring the neighborhood. They find more trash cans, knock them over, start eating, and they'd start doing it at night. And then they realize people are around, but the people aren't scary. They don't do anything. So they become more bold and they don't worry about it. And then they start seeing, they start, oh, whenever there's people around, there's good food. So now they start associating people with good food and they start 
to you know encroach more and more and it just builds up on itself where you, now you have bears like i said entering vehicles they break into homes to get at food and they become problem bears that is how the whole cycle is and that's how it starts so how common is this angie what do you think i mean it's per year how many human bear conflicts would you expect in the united states several hundred Ooh, you're way under, way oh, under. Oh, price is right. <laughs> price is right yeah. rule. So I'm, I'm not out go. of the game yet. Okay. Yeah, we're uh, several thousand. A little bit. Yeah. Higher. Not several. 10,000. Higher. Wow. Okay. 20,000. A little bit higher. Yeah. 30,000. Okay. Lower. <laughs> you can say <see> halfway. <laughs> halfway. 25,000 human yes. conflicts per year. In the United States, roughly 25,029. Wow. And they, they took wow. data from okay. 2009 to 2014, averaged it, and this is across the United States. So 25,000 human black bear conflicts reported. I mean, I, I guess it makes... 25,000. How many is that a day? That's... Wow, yeah. That's like 100, just... what, uh, less than 100 a day, like 80 a day or something? Yeah, that's well, I mean, to, yeah, there's just more math. people and more of our food and yeah. more of our garbage, garbage, yeah. garbage, garbage, garbage. And that's garbage, a different pod for a different day. But okay, out yeah. of all the states, who's number one? Oh, well, not Florida. Uh, I would know, I guess I would know that the number's higher if that's the case. Uh, uh is it Florida? It's Florida. <laughs> that way, <laughs> yes. Man, my Florida is boring. Yeah, but that's good. They, that's because we don't leave our garbage out at all. They said over five thousand five hundred eighty-four conflicts in Florida reported. Really? Yeah, Florida was number Florida one. Florida is always top at interesting <laughs> statistics. That's all I'm going to say about, <laughs> about it. Yeah, it's. It, I mean, because okay. there is, and that's the thing about Florida is pretty much all the wilderness in Florida should be gone in like twenty, thirty years because of development, yeah. or most of it. Yes, Chris, uh, that could be it as well. Maybe I was, uh, we'll talk about their hibernation, but Florida bears, in, interestingly enough, they don't enter a full hibernation. Mm -hmm. They enter some light topor. Mm -hmm. So maybe they're, they're just wandering around more throughout yeah, the year than uh, if they were living in a different state. But like you said, we're a pretty highly developed state. Uh, we have a fair amount of wilderness left, but that's every year it gets less and less. Right, right. Now, New Jersey was second with 2,600. So Now, I would have never guessed that. Okay. Yeah, yeah Jersey. I just, guessed okay. it. I just assumed out west. No. Monta no I was no. going to say Montana, Idaho. No. 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 I mean, just, yeah, not a lot of, not densely. I guess not human. a lot of people. Right. Yeah, not huge, densely populated with people. This is one of the sad statistics of all this is this results in 1,772 bears killed per year due to human wildlife conflicts. So that's how many are killed uh, per year. So Canada, for our, our friends in the Great White North that, that are listeners, thank you. We love you. We love Canada. Uh, hopefully the borders open one of these days and can get back there because I just I have to love Canada. Uh, they reported, I, this was huge. I, I added it up, around 450,000 conflicts per year. And they only kill about 500 bears. So it's it seems like a bigger problem. There's more... Because there's probably a lot more bears up there sure. than in the lower 48. But I was surprised by that. That was a lot. That was a lot. And I, I checked my math. So bears are, are everywhere up there, I guess. And again, that only still leads to one human killed per year by a black bear. So out of all that, that conflict, if right. that, it's less than one. So really quickly, solutions. There's no single solution, but what they proposed in this study was public education, uh, enforcing ordinances, capture and release, aversive conditioning. So this behavior uh, tried to uh, provide a negative reinforcement for that, compensate people for damages. Then they talk about, you know, deprivation or, or hunting permits, things like that, manage the bears, but population management, those are the things I'm like, eh, about, but you know, they, they are trying to work to lessen this so people can respect and live with the bears in harmony where there isn't a lot of this conflict. So 
that kind of sums it up if it made sense. It is a big problem. It's a big problem, especially with black bears. Wow, Chris, some of those statistics are really staggering, and it just goes to show that we we do need more education about these black bears so that we can live in harmony with them more so than feel like we're in threat or that they may become a nuisance because of Mm -hmm. our human behavior, right? As humans, we definitely have the ability to change our behavior, change our perspective in order to help wildlife out. But I also think our listeners should know that In 27 states, black bears can be hunted. It's usually with permits in a small portion. It depends on the population or subpopulation in that particular state. Depending on the year, about 30,000 black bears are hunted. So, for instance, in Florida, we have a population of the Florida black bear around 4,500. And obviously, as Chris mentioned, we have yeah. some serious human conflict that I was yeah, not aware yeah. of. Uh, yeah. But people love the Florida black bear because it is pretty rare here. Mm-hmm. And the populations have increased in the past 20 years, but not a lot. But there was a hunt back in 2015. I'm not sure how many bears were permitted to be hunted. And it was based on some research as far as their populations growing. Mm-hmm. There's this human conflict. We need to call some potentially. And so they did, but there's not been a hunt since in Florida, uh, mostly because of public outcry. Uh, It was just people were not fans of it. And then also looking at the numbers, even though our population has grown, still it's not very big. There's huge. Yeah, it's not huge. Yeah, there's just all these small pockets of of subpopulations because, as you mentioned, a lot of Florida's fragmented and developed right, here right. and there and all that. And so when you think of diversity and genetics and free-flowing, right. that it's really not that many bears for such a big state like Florida. But it should be noted that bear hunting is allowed in several states, Montana, for instance, mm-hmm. uh, and it is regulated on a state-by-state basis. And Chris and I and actually Corbin dedicated a whole podcast to talking about wolves and hunting wolves and mm-hmm. what is happening with that, where are, the, where are the issues, what's being done, what are some of the solutions. So you have to check out that podcast if you want more in-depth analysis about some of these large mammals in North America that are still hunted to this day and pros and cons on that. Yeah. Yeah. Hunting carnivores, it, it has a different impact than say hunting deer. Correct. That, you know, d- the, the deer populations boom and they have no natural predators because there's that many around. So I think one of the issues we raise, especially talking about wolves on, on Thursday with Sierra Club is, you know, they're just being reintroduced to their native range, the lower 48. And now you have hunting permits for them when their populations are, are not sustainable. Whereas... Correct say black bears in Canada with 450,000 conflicts, that's a pretty sustainable population. So, you know, looking at it from an eye from conservation standpoint, like Angie said, she beautiful example of Florida where it's just not probably not a sustainable population or these spirit bears on these islands where their populations are lower. So yeah, good points. And I'll link that study so people can go to the, the, the website, click on it and read about the, the conflicts more. They didn't specify. It could have just been someone seeing a black bear in their backyard and picks up the phone and 10 sure. neighbors call. So that's a statistic. Mm-hmm. It's not, oh, there's a black bear in my house. So, so black bears didn't break into 5,000 homes in Florida. No. But awesome. Yeah. Thank was, you for, <laughs> for correcting that and making sure. Cause I was like, what do we got? Like three bears or the like Goldilocks and the three bears? Yes. Or whatever? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Sleep in the different beds. So, all right. So we're going to do evolution quickly. We've done bears quite a bit. So don't have to go too in depth with this. Uh, the family's Ursa day. And again, eight major species across three subfamilies. So the uh, Alleropodinae. It's a big one. Is John's favorite, the black and whites, the pandas. So that's the Oh, (laughs) yes. There was actually an adorable video of uh, pandas at the National Zoo today because out east there was a lot of snow in Mm -hmm. here in North America. I think in New York, Mm D.C. area, Boston. And so their pandas were sliding down the the hill 
in yeah. the snow on their bellies and it was just that's horrible. crazy anyway that's crazy so, yeah. Pandas, yeah, you they are. Pandas. unless you're yeah. done you gotta love unless pandas. you're done <laughs> go back to that episode uh the uh tremor Sitane is the spec bear at south america so that's probably our next bear that we'll cover at some yes, point yes definitely yeah yeah, their own subfamily. Then the Ursinae. So this is where black bears fall in with polar bears, brown bears, sun bears, the Asiatic black bear, which could be a no- whole nother pod because they're they're different. And then the sloth bear. Now of the bears, it, it, the closest relatives to the American black bear isn't the Asiatic black bear. That's just a name. The names are similar. It's actually polar bears and brown bears. So they're more closely related to them than their counterparts in Asia and South America. So when you look at it from the genetics standpoint, the species name of black bears is Ursus Americanus. Very easy, very easy to say. Yes. (laughs) Now there are 16 subspecies. Okay. This is what blew me out of the water. I had no idea. And there's probably more. We just don't know yet, you know, more genetic studies. But of the 16, you have the Olympic black bear. So the Olympic Peninsula and Washington State. New Mexico black bear. The Eastern, the Californian, Queen Islands. Cinnamon black bear was cool. Okay. Then the Glacier, the East Mexican. So that's down in Mexico, black bear. Florida, Newfoundland, the spirit bear. Uh, he's got to call it Spirit Bear, but that's up up on British Columbia, uh, Vancouver Island, right? Mm-hmm. Louisiana has their own black bear. So down there in Mardi Gras. West Mexican. So you have the East Mexican, the West Mexican, the Kenai black bear, the Doll Island black bear, then Vancouver Island black bear. So there's another subspecies up there. So 16 subspecies. It's quite a bit. It's quite a bit. Well, that's just interesting, too. We can put it on our show notes, but just the different flavors and varieties of of color in their coat mm-hmm. and a little bit in their size as well so yeah, yeah i was just like i said i knew about the the florida black bear and yeah. i thought i thought we were real special but now i, I know <laughs> there's a lot there's, there's a lot a of lot. Them. yeah 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 the spirit bears are just my favorite i always love seeing like you know photo pops up that they spotted one sure uh, bear evolution again go back to the myosid 60 million years ago it's where all carnivores started Bears emerged about 30 million years ago. And what we know is black bears migrated to the Americas around 50 to 100,000 years ago, somewhere in that time frame, coming over with brown bears. The, again, largest bear ever, I've covered this again, was the prehistoric South American uh, short-faced bear, which stood 11 feet, 3,500 pounds. But I did dig a little. The largest of all the species living today, and I would have guessed a Kodiak. I would have guessed a Kodiak brown bear would have been the largest. I Same as well. I would have because they're massive. But it was actually the largest bear on record was a polar bear. Okay. And this species, or species, this individual stood over 11 feet tall. Wow. And weighed close to 2,200 pounds. So pretty massive. Papa Massive. bear. Don't mess with Papa polar bear. Wow. Well, Chris, as I was looking at some of these subspecies of black bear, some of them are definitely more brown in color. For instance, the Olympic black bear and mm-hmm. the cinnamon bear, right? Mm-hmm, so that mm-hmm. just led me to the question of, well, how do you how do you really tell the difference between a grizzly or a brown bear and a black bear? Well, in general, it is going to be size because a black bear is typically smaller. But one of the better ways to tell the difference might be to actually look at their shoulder size and their profile of their face and then claw length. Not that you would probably be close enough to look at their claws, but uh, technically the claws of the black bear are much, much shorter than Mm -hmm. a grizzly. And then when you look at their shoulder size, grizzlies often have a prominent hump between their shoulders which is lacking in the black bear. And then lastly, the nose of the grizzly bear is a little bit more concave, whereas the black bear has a little bit flatter nose, if you will. So there are these other anatomical features that can help you tell them apart. Uh, hopefully you're not th- that close to either of them. No, but just if, no. you're, if you're a photographer or something like that. Mm. Uh, but yes, I just thought that was really interesting. 
Oh, I remember being up close to a grizzly, you know, at, at the zoo and across in, in behind the scenes. And literally she's behind you know, two small cages, you know, bars and stuff. But I remember seeing still two feet away, but can't reach through. Like it's, it, it was meshed and stuff. So she couldn't reach through. I remember looking at her claws and I just was like, it was longer than my fingers, like my hand. And then she just staring at me drooling. And I was like, okay, I'm out. <laughs> you know, we fed out her diets. I but, know. Yeah. Uh, I, I have several, I have several friends that were bear keepers, bear line mm-hmm. keepers and took care of polar bears and um, Andean bears and black bear, uh, including my husband, John. He took care of bears for a while. Uh, he really enjoyed the polar bears. But behind the scenes where we worked, there was actually a line from the indoor holding exhibit area, mm-hmm. and it was called Bear Line, where it was probably like two feet set off from the mesh wire that you would do your training mm-hmm. right, or, right, right. or, or vet, veterinary inspections and yeah. things like that. And it was just a nice way to keep you safe. socially distanced <laughs> yeah, safe. from yeah. the bear. But several of my friends, including my husband, they've had great success at training different species of bears to do really important husbandry procedures uh, that help keep them safe and yeah. help keep the veterinarians or the zookeepers safe uh, for, with a protected contact setting. So, oh, I and felt, they really I are felt, sweet. They and they have huge yeah. personalities as well. Yeah, and yeah. Uber, uber smart. So smart. Yeah, I I felt safe. I I was in a totally safe situation, but it's still I was like I don't want to be in the other side with you. Because you're drooling, you're thinking of lunch. <laughs> you're big. <laughs> Maybe it's because we were feeding diets. That kind of probably was it. But yeah. No, anyways, I, I know. But bless John, he he just loves those big carnivores: bears, tigers, lions. I'm like, yeah. keep me with my hoofstock. I might get kicked <laughs> to death or something. But uh, no, um, the I'll scimitar go. oryx or something will take you out pretty quick. I've had some horns <laughs> yes. very close to some yes. of my uh, private parts. Yes. So uh, no, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I can't, oh my gosh, male kangaroos. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. my cowboy days are over. Uh, over, yeah, yeah, yeah but yeah. uh, when I was in my 20s, it was it was definitely a good time. Yeah, I'll leave it to our zookeeper friends. All right, some more facts about black bears they, they can live into their 30s, but most die off in their 20s in the wild. Not too bad for a carnivore, I thought. The oldest no- known was 39 in the wild and then 44 under human care. Black bears can swim like other bears. They're fast, so they can run up to 30 miles an hour, maybe just over. That's 50 kilometers per hour. And I don't remember if we addressed this with with grizzly bears, but this myth that you can outrun a bear downhill because their their legs are shorter in the front or something is a total lie. I've never no. heard that myth, but we're both oh. myths today. So When I was up in California in the wild, I was always like, okay, if there's a bear. Because I was just scared to death of bears as a kid. I don't know. Past life maybe had an experience. I don't know. But I was always like, oh, I'm going to run downhill or climb a tree, which we're going to get to and climbing a tree in a minute. No, you can't outrun them. You really can't. You really can't. They're much faster than you. Uphill, well, downhill, sideways. Well, yeah, they reach speeds of 30 miles an hour and... Uh, yeah, I don't think you can outswim them. They're great. <laughs> they're great swimmers, and and even if you wanted to, you definitely cannot outclimb a black bear. You can't outclimb a grizzly. Let, let me tell you the story. Okay, so there's a video, and I'm going to post it. And I don't know if people have seen it, but I, th- I believe it's in Idaho. It's an amazing video of you know people are on another mountaintop, right? So it's long range, but you see it clearly. At the top of the mountain is, you can see, and the, and the trees are blown down, so you see this very clearly. There's a mama grizzly and her cub, okay? She's at the top. At mid-mountain, there's a black bear, probably a male. I think it's like a male. This is one of the most amazing animal videos I've ever seen. Up, up there with the battle at Kruger Park, which is still one of my all-time favorites, if you've never seen that one. Between lions, crocs, and Cape buffalo. And all about a Cape Buffalo calf. So it, it's an amazing video. So this one, the grizzly catches scent of the black bear. The next thing you know, she turns. And like we said, you can't outrun them. She is beelining it straight for the black bear. Black bear climbs that tree, 
better than any lumberjack on earth. (laughs) Way better. And is at the very tippy top of this pine tree. That grizzly, I used to think, okay, if there's a grizzly, I'm going to climb a tree. That will save me. Holy smokes. That, that showed me no way. That is a bad strategy. That mama grizzly climbed that tree, I think, faster than the black bear. I couldn't tell who was faster. She was up that tree trying to bite at the feet of the black bear to pull it down. And she goes back down, checks on her cub, runs, like just beelines it back. Talk about mama bear. Climbs up that tree at lightning speed, then comes back down. I think she comes back again. It is insane. And I will post the video because you, and now look at our new website because now you just, the video is embedded. You just press play. So I will get that done. We're fancy. (laughs) We're getting there. We're getting there. We're we're modernizing. Three years. Yeah. So it it brought up this, and it's getting a little bit before behavior, but. This bear on bear conflicts, they do happen between black bears and brown bears or grizzlies. Usually black bears are more in heavy forested areas. Yes. Whereas grizzlies are they, they are in wooded areas, but they like to be on the you know open range more. But when they do get in conflict, obviously grizzlies almost always win. They're bigger, stronger, meaner, probably. Longer claws, yeah. Yeah, but black bears can't put up a good defense, so it's not like grizzlies hunt black bears, but they will go after them. Mm -hmm. But this mama bear was not messing around. Like, it was insane. It's an amazing video, so I hope you all check it out. And just quickly, Angie, just just to cover nutrition again real quick, we, we talked about them being omnivores. They will eat carcasses of dead animals, so they will do that. On top of the things you already talked about, nuts and fruits, Honey, bears do love honey. They will go after it. Taking that is some stings. not a myth. That is very no. true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I did read that they're strong. I mean, they can take down moose calves and deer fawns and stuff. So that's probably as big prey items they can get. But like I said, rabbits and you know moles and other things they can get at. They'll, they'll probably eat. Uh, but again, you know, an opportun- opportunistic omnivore, whatever they can find. But garbage, you know, that's that's a problem. Sure. And it really depends on the season too and where in North America they live. Uh, Because of course, in the summer, they're going to consume primarily grasses and berries and things like that. And then if it gets colder, then they might, and they need to fatten up for the winter time, then they might get a little bit more desperate as far as either hunting or going into the garbages and things like that. And once again, depending on where they live in North America, they are going to go through hibernation or dormant period, roughly October through April. So our winter time here in the Northern Hemisphere. But it's not this deep, deep sleep that sometimes is shown on cartoons or things like that. That is a myth because a hibernating bear can wake up. uh, So you don't want to bump into one of those as well. But during this period of hibernation, they really don't eat drink, urinate, or defecate. They're just really shut down. Their metabolism slows way, way down. In fact, they only breathe once every 45 seconds during their hibernation, which I've been doing a lot of yoga and meditation this past year. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> some of these breathing cycles that the instructor will have me do on the app or on YouTube or whatever, it's not even like that long of holding my breath. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't do it. So yeah. if you really put that in perspective, uh, it, it, to only breathe once every 45 seconds is, is insane. You must really have a slow heart rate. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of which, the black bear's heart rate will drop to about 8 to 21 beats per minute during hibernation. So that's very slow, obviously. But as a curious scientist that I always am, I have made me wonder about Florida black bear. Well, we don't get mm-hmm. that cold here. Yeah, yeah. If, if you ask Floridians, they it hits forty degrees Celsius uh, here in Central Florida, and everybody thinks uh, it, not Celsius. <laughs> if it is forty degrees Celsius, <laughs> At, you're dead. Uh, <laughs> you're, what is forty degrees Celsius? It's like one hundred and fifty. Uh, I, I don't you know. Gotta love the mom brain. Uh, I know. Mama Fahrenheit. Bear mom brain. Fahrenheit. That, that should Fahrenheit. be the hashtag for this week. Uh, hashtag Mama Bear Mom Brain. Uh, anyways, uh, but uh, Fahrenheit. Yes. Uh, Floridians think that they're uh, they're really cold, which coming from Michigan, Chicago, my husband from Boston, that uh, 
40 degrees Fahrenheit is not cold. At and 40 rate, degrees, okay, 40, be fair with you, 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Celsius is only 104 Fahrenheit, but to me, to our, <laughs> our international people are laughing at us. I so, know, okay. I know. Florida does get that hot. So it does. Oh, but you're talking uh, the other way. Yes. But uh, at any rate, the Florida black bear, it doesn't do as deep of hibernation to avoid the cold here in North Florida, uh, but they will go into a lethargic state, somewhat of a toper, because we. We do have less food as well. Our our grasses dry up and we do have uh, less fruits on the trees and seeds and all of that. So uh, I just thought that's interesting. And just go to show how, depending on which region they live in, that they can really adapt and evolve to that region in order to stay healthy and stay alive, right? I mean, it, it, we, we kind of joke about it, especially the weather in Florida, but it does make sense from an ev- evolutionary perspective too, that they don't need to hibernate where when I was doing my research, looking at that range, those bears up in Alaska and Canada, the North, I'm like, wow, you know, they, they survive some harsh, harsh weather up there. So yeah, it's interesting stuff. Now, sociality, other behaviors, vocalizations we opened with, what are some of the other things they do? Bears in general are normal, normally solitary, right? They're not super social. Uh, and then the American black bear is no exception. They spend most of their time alone. However, you, of course, are going to have the mother and cub relationship, which we'll talk about. And then in the summertime, when there's tons of food and berries, you'll sometimes see adult female groups and cubs congregating nicely, but not interacting the way that a social creature like a primate would. They're just mm-hmm, basically mm-hmm. tolerating each other in each other's territory in order to get those berries or honey or whatever the food is. And then, of course, male and female come together for breeding season. But other than that, they're, they're, pretty, they're pretty much going to be considered solitary a- animals. And maybe that's part of the case for their intelligence because – they have to be, right? They don't depend on each other to help hunt or find food or secure food or anything like that um, or to protect them from predators or grizzly bears that chase them up trees. So yeah, yeah. whatever the case, they've evolved to be highly, highly intelligent, very curious, uh, very exploratory. Any mm-hmm. Anybody that's ever observed them in the wild or any of my keeper friends that have worked with black bears – know how incredibly intelligent they are. They're they're pretty easy to train using positive reinforcement training uh, at accredited zoos. And, and researchers are actually just starting to explore how excellent they are at navigating where they need to go to find food right. and leaving their territories if they feel encroached upon. Uh, a lot of it probably has to do with their sense of smell, but they're under researched a lot in the wild, but it's definitely known that bears in general have the highest brain to body mass ratio of all carnivores. Mm-hmm. And so black bears are you know, no different. Uh, they're very, they readily adapt. They're remarkably tolerant of people and some psychologists out of Oakland university and Georgia state university discovered in a 2012 study that the American black bear was capable of distinguishing what they call numerosities or differences in numbers. Okay. Which is common, of course, in gorillas and chimpanzees, capuchin monkeys, dolphins, elephants, some birds and some fish. But all those species that I mentioned are all very social species. So finding evidence of them being able to tell Differences in numbers apart. Does this picnic basket have 10 apples in it or 20 apples? Mm -hmm. Uh, And which one would you want, basically, is a really unique finding. And researchers, of course, are trying to extrapolate more on what that means and perhaps how this evolved with them being solitary. I guess some psychologists and animal behavior experts think that what helped humans become so smart was our social abilities, right? Like. Mm -hmm. Sticking together, learning how to mm-hmm. read one another, hunting together, collaborating together, building cities together, right, right. for instance. Uh, so it's really quite fascinating, and but obviously a lot more research is needed. Always, always. And then going to communication, I know in the beginning I joked about running from that because it would scare the living daylights out of me. 
Actually, with black bears, you shouldn't run because, again, they would see you as prey. Uh, the advice with black bears is you face them and back away slowly. Uh, black bears do mock charge quite a bit. And if they do, you're supposed to stand your ground, look bigger, and shout. They're usually more timid. So I think grizzly bears is cover up, and then polar bears is just say your prayers. So, you know, but black bears, as far as if you do run into one, don't run from them because that may, you know, have them chase you. But what are some of these other communications that, that we're talking about? Right. Well, being such a highly intelligent species, even though they are solitary, they will let you know their emotional state. Uh, and they do this through sounds, which I'll talk about in a second, body language, which you just mentioned, like the mock charges, and then, of course, scent marking. And Chris, as I was reading several articles and scientific blogs about black bears and their different behaviors, uh, one PhD student put it really well and said, once I learned all of these communication tactics, I became much more comfortable studying them from a distance, <laughs> of course. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I wasn't fearful, like you mentioned, growing up, because they really yeah, will let yeah. you know what they're thinking. And for instance, if they're feeling friendly and nice, they're going to make sounds like grunts and cooing and squealing. And when they're actually scared or apprehensive, they're going to clack their teeth or blow, if you will. Uh, when they're really stressed out or scared or pa in a panic state, they actually make a human-like sound that's really high-pitched. And then they can also moan as well. So learning how they talk to one another with their bodies and with their vocalizations, you can almost start to predict their behavior and really how upset are they or how likely are they to quote-unquote attack you. And then getting to repro, we know like hibernation is a big deal for those that do hibernate. Mm -hmm. uh, with their cubs, right? So what anything specific about black bears? Are we just an you know, overview? Well, yeah, Chris, as you mentioned, mama bear and her cubs are going to stick together for a while. She has a lot of things she needs to teach them as far as where to find food, how to find food, how to stay away from danger, things like that. Once they separate and go their ways after about 18 months together, so mama bear, that's why we say that, uh, mm -hmm. because she does stick with them for a while. They're going to separate around breeding season, and that's going to, depending on what region they live in, that can be anywhere from June to July. It's going to be in the summertime, mm -hmm. and that's when the female the mama bear is going to come into estrus. So once mama bear kicks her 18-month-old cub to the curb, mm -hmm. it's time to go. <laughs> she, she's typically in estrus, and she's basically looking for a male to breed with. And during this time, she'll leave scent trails all over for male bears to pick up on. And although several males might track her and love her perfume smells, uh, usually the larger male and the more dominant one is going to chase away smaller males. And once he reaches the female, he'll assess her receptivity or where she is at in her estrus cycle by, by sniffing her and seeing just how receptive she is and... Once they both realize that they like each other, if you will, mm -hmm. they'll play together, they're rest together during courtship. Uh, they may tell other bears, hey, stay away from us. We're paired up now. And then they will breed. American black bear breeding usually takes a little while, their copulation, uh, just because black bears are induced ovulators. So they, mm -hmm. they need the stimulation from the male baculum or the male, the bone in the male penis to actually then ovulate. But once those eggs are fertilized, bears will experience delayed implantation. So our embryonic diapause where everything freezes and the embryo just basically waits for a while until hormonal cues come from the mother. Okay. It's time to, keep growing. And then that's when they will implant in the uterus and start growing. So it's known that American black bear gestation takes about 220 days, but exactly how long the delayed implantation will take or the embryonic diapause, it just depends on probably the nutritional state of the animal, where they live, uh, the overall health of the animal, things like that. But in general, births are going to occur in January or February. Uh, while the female is still in a hibernating or toper-like phase. 
Uh, and litters of cubs can range between one to five. I thought I didn't wow, realize yeah, five, yeah, but yeah. two to three is average. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they're tiny and yeah. they're pretty, pretty helpless when they're born. Those little cubs are naked and blind and they just snuggle with their mom. And so the little cubs grow, hang out with their mama until it's time to emerge in the springtime when the weather is nicer. Uh, and when this happens, they're still pretty small. Uh, bears are only about two to five kilograms when they start leaving the den. Uh, and, and of course they're always very close to mom's side as is depicted in many videos. And, yes, yes, yes. Uh, all of that. Uh, and, but they're weaned around six to eight months of age. But once again, they stick with mom till they're about 18 months old, yeah. learning all the intricacies of being an adult black bear. Mm-hmm. So a lot of parental guidance and care to get them where they need to be as such an intelligent omnivore, right. basically. Right, right. And Papa Bear, although he doesn't have a huge role, he doesn't really contribute to the offspring or the cubs directly. But Papa Bear is known to actually drive off competitors in the territor- territorial range. So it helps mama and cub get more food, not have any aggressive encounters with grizzlies per se and things like that. So he has like a secondary role mm-hmm. to helping his own offspring survive. Uh, females are not going to reach sexual maturity until they're anywhere f- from two years or older. Uh, and once they do mature, they're only going to have a cub every other year, right? Because they, they, they hang out with their cubs until they're about 18 months old. Uh, where males are going to reach sexual maturity around three to four years old, but really hit their stride around 10 to 12 years old when they have a larger territory, they're more dominant and bigger to fight off the younger males. And then just, you know, talking about conservation, black bears now are least concern. There's estimated over 600,000 American black bears just in North America. So they are suffering from habitat loss, do get hit by cars, conflicts with humans. Again, those are all things that drive their numbers down. Uh, But they have come off the endangered species list in the United States, you know, uh, that was protecting them. That's good news. Yeah. Due to conservation and education. Now this week, as we said in the beginning, we were going to highlight the Sierra club. So a major organization that really has always fascinated me since I was a kid. My dad was a member of the Sierra club and you know, they, they do multiple things for conservation. The biggest thing is I think they work a lot on protecting habitat in our environment. And their first member was, you know, John Muir was one of the first members, you know, one of the first naturalists uh, in the United States helped found the Sierra club. So, you know, they, they state that they've evolved into an organization that works to advance climate solutions and ensure everyone has access to clean air, clean water, and a healthy environment. And that's, I mean, they do so much. They do so much. And they have millions and millions of followers that donate. And it's just an amazing, amazing organization. We were so excited to have them on. And we talked a little bit about the wolves, and then again, indigenous people in that interview. So you can go to sierraclub.org which is S-I-E-R-R-A, club, C-L-U-B, dot org, and check them out, support them, follow them on social media, a, a wonderful organization, and I know we'll have them back on, like, for sure, for sure. Yes, Chris, I have to say, when uh, you let me know that we secured the interview, or I should say you did, I had that, looks like we made it. Yeah, like, I, I had that feeling of like, whoa, what? Yeah, I know. They're talking to us. That is awesome. Because otherwise, I was just going to have to interview my mom this week. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we've got some great interviews coming and, and more on the it's way. So and more on the way. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. more on the way. Anyways, great episode. American Black Bear. We hope you enjoyed it. Share this info with your friends. Share it with your animal fanatics. Social media. We love you. Thank you so much. Have a great week. And we'll be back next week with the new species. Thank you, everyone, for listening, learning, loving, conserving. Don't forget that you are all conservation heroes. So thank you. Listen, learn, share. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com.